Good morning. I'm talking to you from my office in Boston, and I hope the connection works. Please let me know if there's a problem. I have three hours, right? It's 10, 20. As much as you want. Is it said three hours? So I... <laughs> okay. Microneurosurgery is really truly for AVM resection. That's what it was built and best for. It is not dead, it is evolving. Let me explain. Then I'll tell you why I think the safest course of action for brain AVM is microneurosurgery and its cure. Otherwise, I think it's worth talking about because it's life-saving. These are neurosurgeons. We have the ability to do that, especially in hemorrhaged cases. I want to put forth that Spetzer Ponce A or Spetzer Martin grade one and two really is the quintessential operation for microneurosurgery. I want to talk about how to avoid the risk of embolization. What are these steps in surgery of the brain AVM? Some examples and then how I can do it better and how we all can do it better. The field is evolving, it is not dead. It is a tool, a technique, a philosophy, an art. It is imparted to us by our teachers, by their goals, ambitions, and what they achieve during their life, they give to the next generation and we make it our own. And this came to me when I was thinking about it, that it truly must evolve because if I teach the next person, they don't do it exactly like me. You know, I stand on the shoulders of these people and many others before them to make it work for me in my hands. And that is an improvement as the technology improves, as our ability to take care of patients improves, their outcomes improves. Uh, so it's, it's a living thing evolving within our own hands. And to my um, point here, I'm saying that AVM is the quintessential case for microneurosurgery. I'm not against other modalities, but I am for advocating the safest way forward for a patient. And I wanna, I wanna try to show you that today. You know, the, a lot, of, lot is, goes into the decision-making for brain AVM, but essentially it's very simple. It's got to be better than the natural history. And it should be a cure. The natural history, 2.2% risk per hemorrhage per year. You got to do better than that with the associated morbidity mortality. If you don't, it's no favors to the patient. And um, just to jump to it, this is a, a very beautiful article written by Dr. Spetzer towards the end of his career where he put together, um, you know, the three-tier application Instead of five grades, you made it into three, you can lump the grade ones and twos. And specifically, that's where I want to talk about because the outcomes across the world were so good with grade one and two surgery that it behooves us as surgeons really to do these cases. There, you know, it's very unlikely that you would see a case that you would get, you would say no to. And it's important to note that because when you say no, Use the, we are the gatekeepers. Other modalities will be done and often probably not as good. So, um, you know, radio surgery is, is, is great for certain cases, but probably not for grade ones and twos. There's a latency, there is a complication rate, and microsurgery being less than a 2% risk of a ma major complication is hard to beat. And when I say less than a 2% risk of a major complication, I don't mean just by Dr. Spetzler and Morgan. I mean by people who have learned the skills of, uh, of the microneurosurgery necessary to do these cases. Here's a paper we published with the fellows of Dr. Morgan, just looking at their first uh, experiences. And you can rest assured that if you learn those techniques and practice them, you can have acceptable results that are on the order of master surgeons. Um, this is a QSUM analysis showing that as you go forward with grade ones and twos, uh, the outcomes can be just the same. And, and the majority of these were done without embolization. And I, and I attribute this to the techniques that I wanna share uh, today with all of you. 
Um, you know, so here's what I was saying about be careful what you say. Uh, we as neurosurgeons are given a lot of responsibility. And if somebody were to say the neurosurgical opinion is that it's not safe for resection, you have to believe that someone else is still going to treat that AVM. And they may, you know, they may give embo, they may give partial embo, they may give radiation. It certainly impacts the psychology of the patient. I mean, look at this case, right? You've got a 32-year-old who presents with seizures for his whole life. He's got a Spetzer Martin grade one AVM. And he came to me as a third opinion because he was told by two others that it's inoperable or shouldn't be operated too dangerous. And, you know, I, I suspect that everybody has their reasons. But maybe we don't have to speak as it's gospel, right? We can, we can we can give the patient hope and give them options. Certainly, this is not an inoperable lesion. We went on and fixed it, but you can see that he hemorrhaged before uh, before it was before it was operated two years after diagnosis. So again, I'm not against other modalities. I just want to advocate for surgery because it does work and it can be done in a generalizable way by many neurosurgeons. Uh, another case for good microneurosurgery is that the ruptured AVM comes to you in the middle of the night, they're young patients, you can save their life. Um, it's a straightforward operation. You know, you might say, oh, well, I'll just do the decompression and take some blood. Yeah, you could, but also you could take it out and you can finish it, or if you get into trouble, you can finish it if it starts to bleed too much. I mean, look at this guy, he did great, right? This GCS3T with, with AVMs is way different. It's way different than Hunton has grade five, okay? Or GCS3T from trauma, it's way different. These patients can do, do great. There's a, another GCS3T, middle of the night, big hematoma. Uh, you gotta take the hematoma out and while you're there, you know, fix the lesion, that can be done, and these patients can do well. I guess my point to this, even if you don't want to do it in the middle of the night, my point is don't give up. These young patients uh, go on to have successful lives in college and so forth. Another GCS3T patient we did uh, as an emergency, and he, and he went on and did great. And <clears throat> so I looked at that, and we try to publish this concept that you know, we when you get the ruptured case, often the, the nomenclature vocabulary is Hunt and Hess, but is that really right? That was made for a, aneurysms. So we just added a few variables to it after looking at 180 cases of hemorrhage and came up with a ruptured AVM grading scale that gives you a benchmark to say, okay, if it's a ruptured case, I can expect this patient to do well 96% of the time if they have this RAG score. Um, and then you can keep track of your own results against those benchmarks. And if anybody's interested in collaborating on this project now to validate this study, we'd be happy to uh, collaborate with any institution with ruptured AVMs. Uh, I will make the point though that, that um, microneurosurgery for the brain AVM is special. I don't think it's tumor surgery. I think it has its own techniques. And these techniques help avoid the risk of embolization. So I want to take a minute to talk about surgical embolization and why I think avoiding those risks will end up with a better outcome for the patient. You know, why do we embolize brain avians? Why? Well, it was done for a long time, um, 40 years, and, but I think now we're realizing it's not the way to go. And I'll just tell you why. I'm not here to, you know, it's not like I'm preaching. I'm just saying this works for me and it's something I learned and want to pass it on. People embolize for various reasons, perceived risk of, of blood loss, death, surgeon convenience, it emboldens us. I'm not sure that's right, but it does. But in the end, your, your goal is that the risk of surgery plus embolization should be risk than, less than the risk of surgery alone. And I'm not sure that's true because you want to have a lower MR asset follow-up. So, uh, you know, it's not free. There's a 7% complication rate in this meta-analysis in the best of hands. I mean, here's the one that we published that, uh, that, you know, I do also do endovascular and so does Ali Sultan, my partner, who is a wizard way better than me. And, and I think that even in his hands where you still have a non-negligible, non-zero rate of complication, it's hard to dig yourself out once you cause a complication from embolization. Sure, you'll have those cases where you get away with it, but not all the time. 
I think in the end, it's better to try it without, because he, you know, here's his publication, Morgan's publication of embolization in a whole series that were preoperatively embolized versus those that were not, and the outcomes were not different. So I'm not saying don't embolize, rush to the operating room, take on the grade four ABM. I don't think that would work. What I am saying is that we need new techniques, different ways of thinking about the AVM and operating on the AVM as opposed to making it a tumor with onyx, but rather understanding its physiology, right? This is, this is treating the physiology. It's, it's different than a malignancy. Uh, so I want to share those AVM techniques that avoid embolization. And really, it's surgical embolization from, from Michael. And the concept comes down to this. You do the arachnoid dissection. You figure out what are the superficial feeders that are coming into the AVM. Clip those off. But then here's the difference. Go straight to the bottom. Get that bottom feeder. Now the thing is soft. The AVM turgor is down. You can push on it. You can dissect it out of eloquent cortex as you sweep those vessels back into the AVM. You know, many of the vessels that you see in the white matter, I think these are not arterial feeders. These are dilated venous channels. And the last thing you want to do is take the veins. So when you go around the thing, like standard fashion, you're kind of making it more and more tight, more compressed, and then the bottom feeder can't get out and it pops and you chase it and bad things happen. I'm sure it's never happened to anybody, right, Andy? But it, but it, it, but it can be avoided. It happens to all of us. Uh, these are the techniques. Um, you know, vessels come, come from the scalp after recurrent AVMs, previously operated AVMs. They can be transosseous. You gotta take them in the craniotomy. Uh, they can be dural, sulcal, white matter, and then the cone. But the concept is going in a very systematic way of taking those large craniotomies, falcine windows to bring the deep AVM to the surface. So here's the basic concept when you go into the OR. I like to, to think about it as these are the targets and I put them up in the, in the OR. Uh, you know, what are the inflow vessels that I need to take? Here are these middle cerebrals, ACAs. And even now, what we're doing is using navigation, circling these vessels on the stealth, and just going color by color. Go one, two, three, four, as you dive deep into the AVM. Uh, illustration of those feeders. This was a recurrent, recurrent hemorrhaged, radiated AVM um, in an older person, 45 year old. And so here you dissect find the vessels. These are all the superficial feeders, right? Now the AVM's getting softer and you can go a little bit deeper. The turgor is coming out of it. Here's the next one. And then the concept of going to that cone, the bottom. So on the left top here is the sort of standard tornado view. But when you get down to this number four, it's supercharged because the veins around the AVM nidus have been barked, tree barked, injured. So instead, go straight down early in the operation. Here's an illustration of that in this bottom. You know, using the bipolar, sweep the, pole, the vessels back in. I'll show you some more cases. But I think this really works. Uh, getting to the bottom early obviates the need for preoperative embolization. You're doing the embolization by surgery and it's in your absolute control. Here's the, here's a abs, you know, very clear example of how you would do this small and then extrapolate that to big. This is a, a very smart uh, medical student here uh, who came to us and, and, and wanted an opinion about this Spetzer Martin grade two arterial venous malformation in the occipital cortex. He needs his vision to do a good job in his life. And you know, the concept is you do the arachnoid dissection. I don't think anybody would say, don't take that feeder first. Of course you would. That's how you take this down. It just happens to be the bottom feeder. So it's an illustration of, um, illustration of taking it down and then the AVM is soft. and comes out rather simply. Again, grade ones and twos done easily, straightforward. He had no visual defects. And I think the reason for that is once the AVM is soft, 
then you can peel it out of elephant cortex without, you know, without as much trouble. So I'll give some examples now as I go through um, cases. This is um, just the concept of going back to front in the interhemispheric fissure. All of these were medial AVMs, and, and it's probably safer to bring them up to the surface by doing a bilateral craniotomy and being able to approach it from both sides, transfalcine windows. So this was, uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, another case, the man was told inoperable. Uh, it came up because, uh, you know, he had some dental work done. He had some funny pain. He got a scan. You know, it's a grade, what a grade, probably grade one, maybe grade two AVM. Again, very safely cured by microsurgery. So in my mind, what do I think of when I see a new patient? First thing is, can I do it? Can I safely take this out? And number two is, should I do it? Is the patient too old? Other risk factors? Would I injure the patient? And if, if the answer is yes, then that's it. You know, it's not necessarily that the grading system tells you whether or not you should operate. It's the opposite. Is the grading system helps you benchmark cases you think you can do, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't tell you which ones to do. Alternatively, patients might say, oh, I'm going to get radio surgery," and you might say, well, there's a latency period to that, and it may not work, and I think we can do better with just micronurse surgery in this case, no preoperative embolization. And as I was saying, I wanted to just show you, see, that was the interhemispheric approach coming from the opposite side, cutting the falks, and now we, you know, we can go back and forth. Again, the principles take the arterial feeders, here's the clips. And it, it just is, uh, makes it so much softer before going into the brain. And then by polaring the white matter and sweeping the venous loops back in, here's the deep feeder. And then the end of the operation where even part of the calcified AVM should come out. And then the, the, rest, the rest of the empassage vessels are, are feeling well. This is the post-op. He did great, of course. Here's another case, a contralateral approach of a motor cortex, small motor cortex AVM that was ruptured, sent for radiation. The patient didn't want radiation. He came with microsurgical opinion. I, I agreed with that. The functional showed his foot was very near that, but you're going to be okay. He's going to be fine. Here's the sort of the whole case um, beginning to end in pictures. This is the transfalcine view. So going from uh, the right side through the falks to the left side in order not to retract the brain. Here's now through that window, you see the feeders. And then this next picture, the third picture is en passage. So I use the sunt clips on the en passage vessels so I don't damage the endothelium of the parent vessel. And then lastly, the resected AVM. And he did fine. Uh, there is a little T2 flare there, as one would expect, but he did not have an M, uh, a deficit. And again, I think we can do better than SRS in this case, even though it's small and very likely to involute from SRS, that can take time can lead to a complication rate in the motor cortex. I uh, would not embo this. It's, you can't dig yourself out. If you have a less than a 2% complication rate with grade ones and twos, it'd be very difficult to, to justify embo even in the greatest of hands. And it's a cure with surgery. It doesn't have to worry about it. Uh, another case, the contralateral approach with hemorrhage. This is a further back in the head, 43 year old man. Uh, presented with this probably grade three AVM. You see a lot of it is in the ventricle, but it does come with parietal occipital lobes. <clears throat> so again, options, can I do it? Should I do it? And then what should I do about it? Uh, that's a shunt that I placed preoperatively because he came in with hydro. 
One of the reasons I waited on this guy's case was logistics. Uh, there is rare but real episodes of vasospasm after certain cases, and I, I had a sense of that. I waited the three weeks, and also because uh, you, you want to be ready, you want to have the right team. So there's the case. There's the angiogram, lateral angiogram. So when I see these, I'm thinking, what are the feeders? There's these deep feeders that come off PCA, ACA, and I want to get these. Now, some people might say, well, let's put a catheter in. I can onyx these very safely. That's true, you can, but I think we can do them safer at the time of surgery. Dissect the arachnoid, clip these off. You have absolute control over them, and the AVM will be soft. There's the deep feeder, there's the targets in my mind. This is coming up into the ventricle. We're gonna find that on the deep side of the AVM. ACA feeders, PCA feeders. So again, that's the approach is a sort of a semi-sitting, posterior, uh, parietal, occipocraniotomy, coming from the contralateral side with a transfalcine window. This is the window, this is the video from left to right. We're working on both sides as necessary. Now, see, the, the transfalsing window brings the feeders that are at the PCA territory early in the operation. You don't have to wait till you get to the bottom. You're at the bottom from the beginning. There it is. So we put the clips. That starts the whole process of allowing the AVM to get soft. And I use temporaries because I'm not always sure. I can double check my work as I come, you know, we dissect it further and further, closer and closer to the AVM, make sure there's no empissage feeders and you can remove and adjust temporaries as necessary. Niral. Yeah. Uh, some particip participants are wa wondering uh, how you differentiate especially on the surface AVMs, uh, feeders uh, from the arterialized veins. That's a wonderful your, question. I'd love to talk about that. Yeah, please extend my time. Um, don't let it count against me. So this, these feeders and veins, you can tell a couple of things. The way God made us is the veins are more superficial anywhere in the body than the arteries, right? In the wrists anywhere and that's true about AVMs too. The feeders are a little bit underneath in the sulci. The veins, big veins are on top. Then you might say okay what about as you go deeper? Okay the color is different and I'll, I'll remember to point that out. It's a salmon colored. The artery is more salmon colored. The veins is a little more. It's not the blood is different color it's the actual tissue because the vein is thinner you see a darker kind of tissue. The way it bounces is different. The veins are often wider. The arteries are more narrow. And as you accustom your, your brain to it, you'll just see it. You'll just see it. So this, I'll, I'll point it out. And the arteries have, will have that grayish sometimes uh, uh, appearance on their surface due to the hypertrophy from the uh, uh, constantly working, pushing blood, right? So this is the deep feeder I mentioned coming up from anterior circulation coming into the ventricle. See, before I've removed the AVM, we haven't removed it, we're able to get to it right there. You see, we made a beeline the size of a patty, half by three. There's a ventricle. I'm gonna show you the, the artery. There it is. Now we're gonna, you see the color is more of salmon color. Gonna clip it to take the turgor out of the wall. Remember, these are not normal arteries. They're distended due to the physiology. It's not a neoplasm, but so much blood is flowing through. The vessel wall has expanded and thinned. So if you just try to bipolar, if there's not as much protein in the wall, it might pop. So Dr. Sant made these clips uh, to decrease the turgor in the, in the vessel so then it can be bipolar safely and cut. So you don't chasing it, you know. Unfortunately, Dr. Sun's clips were now discontinued by Cogman. It's very sad for me. All right. 
and then uh, then we finish, right? The end is the vein and take out the AVM. Here's the draining vein, put a clip on it, cut it straight forward after you've done hidden steps. And here's the sort of whole case put together pre-op. Post-op, you see it's not a lot of damage to the brain because we're coming in on the contralateral hemisphere not using a retractor on the brain. You can use a retractor on the AVM, I think, but it's different than the post-op angiograms, and he did, he did very well. Uh, I'll give you some now examples. I just thought I would pull some cases of motor AVMs, try to learn, impart some experience about motor AVM. Uh, okay, the case is a 24-year-old, uh, who had bled with the 3.1 centimeter motor cortex compact AVM. So again, at, does she need surgery? Does she need treatment? First, she needs treatment. She's young. She has two kids. Natural history would suggest she will rupture again. Second, uh, can I do this AVM? Uh, and should I do this? Yes, I think we can do it. I think it can be done. Should it be radiated? Well, there's a latency period to that. I wouldn't trust it. Greater than three centimeters, less, less chance of it working. Should we embolize it? Well, again, digging yourself out of a hole. Surgical embolization during the craniotomy and, and microsurgical dissection is, is probably better, just the way I'm thinking about it. I'm not trying to tell you to change, just, just some experience. So the decision-making here, we just summarized that. The targets, again, it's all about targets. When you get in there, I'm thinking, what's my lateral MCA target, posterior ACA target, anterior ACA target, how do I get there? First step, extensive arachnoid dissection after a large craniotomy. So you take your time, dissect, clip. I love this part of the operation, dissecting. I turn the clock off. You don't really think about anything else, just this arachnoid, I'll cut this arachnoid. This arachnoid, I cut this arachnoid. Then going to the bottom feeder here, see the retractors on the AVM. It's soft now because you took the superficial feeders. Look, that's a nidal uh, vein. It was gray and squiggly. Those are veins. Now we're going to come to the bottom. There's a ventricle. And all of this is the beginning of the operation. Then you can go and finish the rest. You know, then the AVM is soft. You go around it, take it out in one piece, of course. And, and you leave the, leave the motor cortex as good as you can. Now, one point about this case, uh, here's a post-op. It looks good. She's got, um, you know, no early venous drainage. No infarctions. But the day she woke up, she was plegic. And that's a scary thing for a young mother as well as for nurses and your team. But you know, have confidence, have faith, have patience. Three months, she's got a cane. One year, she's perfect. I've known her for a long time now. Every year, she's happy. And, and I think it's worth that time period in rehab or whatever it takes to, to get the cure. And there's always, there's a little bit of flare changes around the territory. I mean, that, that it does come with taking AVM out of white matter. But I try to minimize that, you know, it feels better if there's less. Um, this is a 77-year-old man. You might say, what am I doing operating on 77-year-old? Well, you got to sort of think to yourself, does he have 10 years to live? That's the first thing, right? Because if he doesn't, there's no point in doing this. Um, but the, he kept having seizure after seizure after seizure. It was really difficult for him, and that was the idea. Now, we're just putting together the series on seizures. I think there's probably uh, about a 60% uh, redu like 60% of patients will benefit from AVM surgery for their seizures. And um, many of those will go on to be seizure free. We're just, we're just trying to put that together now. Um, what's interesting about this case, look at this big venous barracks. 
So it's sitting in motor. There's the hand area of motor, AVM, and then the venous varix is kind of more anterior, inferior towards Broca's area. The deepest feeder, I pointed it out here. So again, same concept how to do. There's uh, some still photographs of the AVM going to the bottom, taking out that deep feeding vein, but also remember, you know, just doing an arachnoid dissection is the first step. Uh, I use this 11 blade. It's made by Swan Morton. It's something I learned from Dr. Morgan and, and, and he learned from Thor Sunt. Um, it's very nice. It's a good way to do things. You're just cutting arachnoid, but you put it on stretch. You use the suction. I use the suction, put the arachnoid on stretch, and then cut, and then start over. Here the forceps are grabbing the arachnoid of this artery. And then we move to the next position. Uh, the next artery on the CTA or, or preoperative DSA. And we find it, clean it up. You see the color is different there on the artery. It's deeper, it's different than that reddish color of the veins. It kind of looks more robust. And I, I'll just say that you think you can't dissect it, you're getting scared, you can. Just persist in that sulcus. You can get it. And the more clips you put on those early arteries, the less risky this AVM becomes. The, you know, even if it hemorrhages, once you put clips on, it's gonna be straightforward to stop the hemorrhage. You put a patty, a little compression, and it becomes very, very safe. I mean, that ultimately, that's why people do embolization. So this is the same concept. We're taking the, the fight out of the AVM early. You see the veins are already changing. You can use the uh, rotin. You can, you can use sharp dissection. You can use scissors, whatever works. That's the deepest feeder. Now I look at it and I take a deep breath. I say, okay, now it's getting better because those arteries uh, have been taken care of. And now it becomes safer to get the bipolar out and start doing a dissection, a white matter dissection. I'm gonna speed it up. So, and even, even the nidus, look, the way you dissect it is trying not to injure it. Just dissect that little bit of white matter around the vessels and sweep the AVM nidus back. You know those loops of vein, they just have done that because they're trying to preserve the kinetic energy of the blood. Now you take them back out of the white matter, bring them back to the AVM so it doesn't injure that part and doesn't cause a venous hypertension in the AVM when you're taking it out. And I think this really helps because then you can quick, nicely, precisely dissect right on the AVM when you're in motor cortex or speech, or brainstem, wherever you are, you're dissecting right on the AVM. Now, I was going to tell you about this guy. Um, so here at the end of the operation, everything looks pretty good. I'm happy. But I'm wondering about that big venous barracks. I know it's going to thrombose right? They always do. That's what you want. So it goes on to thrombose like you want it to. So that's the end. Speed that up. So that venous varix is pretty big and it's going to be difficult to keep that open. You don't want it to necessarily. So what happens? He gets this. It's not a hemorrhage. That's the hyperdensity of the clotted blood in that varix. But because of that happening, he had significant speech problem. He had a hand problem. And, and I, uh, I just put him on some basic subcutaneous heparin in time, and it got better, you know, within a week or so.
got a lot there. But you can kind of predict that when it's a really big vein, when the big veins are going to thrombose, cause mass effect, and, and it'll get better in time. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, it's the same concept. This was a, a young woman told that she's inoperable, and it makes a difference. This poor lady got depressed, and she couldn't have her second baby. And you know, be careful what you tell people. The the psychology can be worse than the disease. But ultimately, we underwent the surgery. Um, there's the vein resection, keeping it clean. Look at the post-op. CTA, you can see some of those squiggles that you saw on the pre-op. Those have to come down in size. That takes time. I'll skip the video. People can, uh, I can come back to it another day. Um, again, they wake up very, very weak, uh, but they go to rehab. And in three months, she's an MRS-1 with some hand problem, coordination problems. But that, I think that will continue to get better. Uh, it always does. Oh, look, this case I wanted to show because of the remodeling. I'll skip some of the details. Again, it's a motor cortex AVM, no embolization. We think we can do it without, but we can do it safer. It's the operation. Um, this just points it out. Look at this. See, this is motor cortex. And you might think that that arrow and this other arrow is pointing to AVM, but be careful. Sometimes it's just the dilated venous channels and you may not want to resect the cortex. So in this case, what we did after doing the whole surgery, like I showed with the dissections of the arachnoid and then putting the clips, decreasing the turgor, taking it out, I made an intraoperative judgment decision to leave behind that squiggle stuff. And you can see here on the angio, you see the squiggles in the very, very late phase. See, there they are, right there. And you might think, oh, geez, is that AVM? It might not be fistula. This could just be the dilated venous. And so for this guy, we kept him down, kept the pressures down, and um, it thrombosed, as one would expect. So then a delayed seven-day angiogram, you can see that all those squiggles are gone. So I'm going to take you through that. Here's a post-op day zero on the right, post-op day seven on the left, and the red arrows are the same. Look at how the vessels remodel. They're very large because of the fistula before. Once you clip and ablate and give it seven days to remodel, they come down in size. Look at the blue arrows are the same arteries. Green arrows, same arteries. That takes time, and before that happens, there's a risk of post-operative hemorrhage in these big AVMs. So I like to keep the blood pressure down. That's what I was taught. But look at this remodeling of the motor cortex. It's really beautiful. Um, there's the post-op day zero that I showed you, the squiggles. You'll see them late in the arterial phase. Very, very late and kind of drawn out. It's not an early vein. And then look on post-op day seven, they're gone. They thrombosed. So instead of, instead of sort of getting into the motor area, we just let it be. Kind of a little similar to that concept that Dr. Spezza talks about with the res partial resection of AVMs in the brainstem. And of course you'll say, well, is that gonna be okay in the long run? Well, we'll continue to follow it every year as we do. I wanted to just make a comment that AVMs can bring friends together. Um, this was a wonderful opportunity for me and I just can't be thankful enough uh, this is Rodolfo, one of our previous fellows, and Yvonne, his partner, really his partner down in Puerto Rico. They kindly invited me to come and participate in some cases that they did. And, you know, here's a 13-year-old girl that otherwise may not have gotten getting care there and um, went down and, and did this case together. For Time sake, I won't show the video, I guess, even though I'd love to. I can watch this by myself. I'll do it after you guys are gone. I'll just watch my videos. Um, the, uh, the vessels are there. Uh, the targets, you see the red one? That's the key, right, Andy? That deep one, that's the one you want to get. Um, so I put arrows on there when we go to the operating room. And, and I show this because, one, is camaraderie, and, two, you can share and learn from each other, and it's great to go down and do these cases 
And then three, you know, again, we're able to affect a cure by microsurgery. These patients are going to be, you know, she's cured. Um, I skipped the video. There she is. She's happy and doing okay. My last case, I wanted to show this because, again, this is another case in Puerto Rico. This is a grade four AVM uh, speech area, and we did this without embolization. But watch what happens just to really prove that point about taking the deep feeder, okay? We take the deep feeder in this case, and the whole thing just gets soft. Uh oh. Well, you go to that PCA feeder early in the operation for that temporal AVM, and it just got so soft. I, I really want to show that, but my presentation seems to be erasing itself. I don't know what's happening. Interesting. Just, it just erased itself. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. Look at that. Microneurosurgery is the way is a way to do these AVMs, I think, in the safest way possible. I think grade ones and twos really should be operated, give a lot of consideration for that. Um, I think that uh, doing without embolization might be, in the end, a safe way to do this if you change the way you think about it and go to the clone room. Um, so. Well, excellent talk. Uh, very motivating, stimulating. Uh, so you. Your statement about uh, you know AVM surgery is not a tumor surgery. So my advice to the young guys, if you want to start the AVM surgery, start doing the tumor surgery like you are doing AVM surgery, especially the GBMs. As if you do the GBMs or any glioma surgery, like you are doing the tumor surgery, start with the feeders, feeders to the tumor, and circumferential cylindrical dissection going down and taking the taking the arterialized uh, tumor draining veins last then you are doing the tumor surgery but you are doing tumor surgery like AVM surgery okay so microsurgery can be applied to many many things even if when you do trauma you can do microsurgery okay you can do cystanostomy like advocated by IP Ch Cherian in, in, in Nepal so you can do many things microsurgically, and this is the this is the these are the examples. And I again thank you very much. Great cases.